first time that I met Brent personally, I knew him from Twitter and we've had some fun conversations. It was two years ago, we went out to dinner in New Orleans. So this is, we had just been to an event for the New Orleans Investment Conference. And it was two years ago and New Orleans was COVID crazy. So there was masks and, and vaccination, whatever too. But Brent had this really cool sport coat on, but he also had what I thought was an ascot around his neck. So my initial, like just meeting him at first, I'm like, Jesus Christ, this guy's got an ascot. What the fuck? But so now halfway through dinner, halfway through dinner, I'm like, you know what? I judged him wrong. I like Brent despite the ascot. And then I found out, then I go, then I get ballsy enough and drinks enough to ask me this. What are you talking about, dude? It's just a mask. I put it over when they asked me to put a mask on. That's <laughs> my, like... <laughs> you know, I started referring it to my, my redneck ascot because I okay, grew up good. in Nebraska, right? So the, right, it, was, it was perfect. I, I hated wearing the regular more. masks. I hated wearing yeah. the regular masks. So I just wore that bandana all the time. And um, yeah, we're done. Really so the point like a, is, like Brent is a good enough guy that he overcame the fact that I thought he was wearing an ascot and I thought he was cool anyway. But anyway, thanks for uh, coming on. No, I, I, I went to a wedding one time where I actually did wear an ascot. That was kind of fun. So anyway. Really? Not, what um, what possessed you to wear an ascot? You think it's just such a good yeah. look? It's just fun, man. <laughs> okay. I wore a vest to a wedding on uh, on Sunday and, and Saturday and I looked so like Dago gangster, which is kind of what I was going for. Nobody else had a vest on. So it was good. Welcome to Future's Edge Podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As always, Bob Marcino. <laughs> we have Brent Johnson of Santiago Capital, one of my favorite guys. Okay, so we have Brent. Brent has a hard stop later on, and we have a lot of shit to talk about. You know, the do- the whole dollar milkshake thing. I know you're probably sick to death of yeah. hearing about the dollar milkshake, but I don't <laughs> care. I want you to thumbnail, explain it real quick to people, because okay. I loved it when it came out. I love it now. Go. Okay, so from a very simple perspective, the dollar milkshake theory is an explanation that the world that we live in from a financial markets standpoint is a relative world. It's not necessarily an absolute world. And as messed up as things are in the United States, and I will admit that things are very messed up and they are probably going to get worse, is that most of the rest of the world, and I would argue all of the rest of the world is in even worse shape than the United States. And as a result, despite all of the crazy monetary policy, the bailouts, the QE, et cetera, et cetera, that the dollar would not get inflated away and fall versus its peers, but in fact, it would get stronger and rise versus its peers. And as the dollar gets stronger versus these other peer currencies, that in itself creates all kinds of volatility and economic problems for the rest of the world. And I think that will ultimately create a crisis. And I don't know whether the dollar going higher creates the crisis or if the crisis creates the dollar going higher. But one way or the other, I think we end up in a world that has a combination of a debt crisis, a currency crisis. And I think the knock-on effects of that will be the dollar higher than most people expect it to be. If you're going to invest money, if you're going to put money into the market, I think on a relative basis, the U.S. is the place to do it as opposed to emerging markets or Europe or China or wherever it is. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting you say that because the worry I have, and I'm not disagreeing you at all, I'm actually agreeing yep. with you, but the worry that I have is that if we don't get into a situation where I think we're a long ways away from not being the best house on a bad block, but I feel like we might be even further away from the block getting any better. So in other words, it, almost like an economic race to the bottom here based as much on government policy in general as it is on sort of this functional monetary policy. Do you have any opinion on which one is worse, governmental policy, monetary policy, or is it, are you a both guy in this case? I think I, I'm not a fan of central banks. Right. I, I am one of the people who thinks that central banks aren't really necessary. But the fact is, is they exist. So I can't ignore them. If, if the I'm the majority if I'm going to in op- this show, Brett, just so you know, you're in the majority. Right. No, but that's the thing is the, the Federal Reserve is a reactionary agency. And so if you don't like them, I agree with you. But if you admit that they exist and you don't have the ability to make them go away, then you kind of have to consider their actions. And I think that. While they have made many mistakes and they will make many more mistakes, again, the rest of the world is populated by these same types of people. They all go to the same schools. They all run the same policies. The system is the exact same. 
and they all think the same way. So to think that China or Europe or God forbid Argentina or Brazil or Australia is going to do better from a monetary policy than the United States, I don't think that holds water because they're all doing the same thing and they're all in the same situation. And the U.S. just has so many advantages that the rest of the world doesn't. And perhaps those advantages are undeserved, but they exist. I come at this from a practical matter of a guy who's managing money for other people in the world that actually exists. Right? <laughs> I don't come at this from a theoretical perspective of how I would like the world to be. And so, you know, when I do a scan of the world and where I can allocate other people's capital, I don't see a big advantage. And in fact, I see many disadvantages to going overseas to do it. Now, I, I want to be clear. I'm not an American exceptionalist. I don't think that we're the only place in the world that has smart people or, or great opportunities. I just think this is the current world in which we live. I think there will come a time where I will think the exact opposite. And I think there will be a time to leave the U.S. and go invest abroad. I just don't think that that time is right now. Has there been a time in, say, the last decade where it was that way? Or has it been this way? I, I, year after year after year, I feel like at the beginning of the year, the trade of the year is to short the dollar and go long EM. And by the middle of the year, that trade has always blown up and never works. Yeah. And so the way, the way I look at things is I, I see like four different scenarios. For some way that I can't currently comprehend, maybe we get out of this mess and the whole world rises together. In which case, I don't think it really matters whether you're invested in the United States or abroad, right? You, you do well in both places. Uh, you could have a situation where the whole world falls together, in, in which case it doesn't really matter if you're in the US or if you're overseas. I mean, you're, you're, you're going down. But, but in that situation, if everybody's falling, I think the US falls less than the rest of the world. We could have a situation where the US does okay and the rest of the world really struggles. Maybe that's a low probability, but you know, I can see that as a possibility. And then the last possibility is that the rest of the world does really well and the U.S. falls. And I think that that is such a low probability that I don't worry about it. And I don't think it's worth the risk reward of that last scenario is not worth it to me. I think it's very unlikely that the U.S. goes into a massive recession or has all, some kind of a crisis and it's not felt in Brazil and it's not felt in Europe and it's not felt in Japan and China. And as a result, when I look at all those things on a risk reward basis, you know, and you, you got to understand also that most of my clients have already made a lot of money. You know, they have a very nice life. They've, they, they've for, for many different reasons, they, they, they've been fortunate enough to build up a big portfolio. And the reality is, is they just don't want to take a step back. They want to protect what they have. And they want to listen. They want to outpace inflation. They want to make a nice return going forward, but they don't need to hit a home run every year. So as much as anything, it's about protecting the downside as it is, is catching every dollar of upside. And when I look around the world and I use those four different examples, I don't see a compelling reason to place capital abroad when I can place it here. And the other thing is rates are much different now than they used to be. You know, I mean, you can get 5% for sitting in a T-bill. That's not horrible. Again, maybe inflation is even higher than that. And if you are man to make that argument, I'm, you know, I'm open to discussing that. But you know, it wasn't that long ago where you could you had to go five, 10 years out on the yield curve and way down in the capital structure to get five percent in a in a fixed income instrument. And now you get it and you just roll it every month. I mean, it's it's really kind of incredible. So when when I put all that together, that's why I have the majority of our assets that we manage allocated on the long side in the United States and then short side, you know, mainly outside the United States. So that's you just actually, that's my question. I had just written it down is, is the <laughs> spread trend on, but I'm going to my next question. Okay. Which is, so something we've talked about on the show a lot, and I'm curious to get your opinion on, this is my opinion. And you know that I don't, I don't mind at all being told I'm bullshit. It happens all the time. I believe that you know, we long and variable effects of Fed rate hikes. We talk about that all the time. I believe this time it's more long and variable because of the fact that just, you know, the five-year period preceding the first rate hike, 10-year yields averaged 1.96%. My point is that everybody and their mother who needed to borrow money had ample time to roll into duration. 
So when rate hikes and higher rates started to hit, there's plenty of people who could sit back and go, whoa, sucks to be you, the new guy borrowing, which in my opinion is moving further out the full punch of yep. rate hikes. Is that true? Does the Fed know this? When can we expect it to hit? Well, I think that they do know this. And I think, you know, for years and years, you would go to a conference or you would go to a presentation and somebody would talk about how they were punishing savers, right? You couldn't get any money unless you, if you didn't want to go way out on the, on the risk return curve, you were punishing savers and, and they kept interest rates so low and they led to all this speculative behavior and, and they were idiots for doing that. Well, now they've raised rates 5% in a year and a half, which is really unprecedented. And I think, you know, in the future, people will look back on this last year and a half and say, holy shit, that was quiet in 18 months. Now they're also idiots because they've raised rates, right? And so, but, you know, now you're, if you're a saver, you can actually get paid a decent amount to, to save. Now, again, if you want to argue inflation is actually higher than that, 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 that's another argument. But at least, you know, you can actually get some money without going out on the yield curve now. And, and here's, here's the interesting thing as well is, Higher rates will eventually lead to a downturn, credit contraction, potentially a crash. Until you hit that wall, the higher rates are sort of, sort of stimulative because that money is coming for, for the people who are saving variable are getting that money, that higher rate immediately. But all the people who are levered long duration and haven't had to get reset yet because the, inter the the hikes just started and the lag effect hasn't caught up yet, there's actually kind of a net benefit or a net stimulus into the market. But it, so it's almost like speeding up into the wall, if that makes it, sense, right? It does. And, and so I'm absolutely on board with the idea that this is gonna end badly. But I think that lag effect on the long end and the variable effect on the short end helps explain why we haven't hit that wall yet. Okay. And, and, so, and, and, and I, yeah, so, so go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. They're just because Brent Donnelly and then is it Sheila Bear, one of the economist women today, we're talking about how not at this time, it's not different. It's just that rate hikes don't work to slow an economy. You are not in that camp, right? No, I think it does work to slow it, but it doesn't a crash. There's a difference between imminent and inevitable. I think that's what so many people are struggling with is, and this is really hard and, and I understand it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not making fun of these people. <laughs> I'm just saying well, there is a difference. We do that on the show too, yeah, though. We no, can make fun no, of whoever we want. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, but, the, but, but there is a difference between imminent and inevitable, right? Like things will yeah. end badly. You know, they just haven't yet. All of the crazy stuff that's happened since 2008, or maybe even go back to 2000, right? Just crisis after crisis, you know, bailout after bailout, QE after QE. And yet the dollar is way higher versus all its peers. The S&P is, you know, tripled or gone up 5x, depending on how you measure it. Employment, people are still employed. The economy is still running. And again, it doesn't mean that under the surface there isn't all these problems. And it doesn't mean that it won't end up costing us dearly. But so far, it's, it's, it's been a very long time that they've been able to kick this can down the road. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that they can't kick it down the road for another couple of months or a couple of years, uh, you know, it's, and, and that's why I think it's so important to kind of have an understanding of why things might end very, very badly, but also have an understanding of why they might not end badly yet. So do you think that, so I was just looking at the personal savings rate today and we're, we're well below pre-pandemic levels now on savings. So a lot of this, according to St. Louis Fed, I'm assuming they're near correct. I don't know. It could be another one of these, whatever. So we got it below uh, pre-pandemic levels. We got credit card balances going up, interest rates on those balances going up. There's one of the lag effects, theoretically, of, of rate hikes. Is, is it possible now that we might, those of us that dislike the Fed, three of us, might actually have to give credit to the Fed because they're starting to shift their narrative, right, in their speeches? They're starting, Lori Logan said that rates are likely high enough plus higher rates down the curve are doing a little bit of the work for the Fed. Bostic today, and again, we're recording on Tuesday. You guys won't hear this till almost a week later, but Bostic today said that uh, rates are probably high enough. Is the fact that they're starting to shift their narrative and some of these maybe leading indicators like consumer savings and things like that are starting to point toward 
a potential slowing because imminent versus inevitable that it's inevitable the consumers the consumers going to slow down will they get their victory lap or will that imminent end badly as we all put it end <laughs> up being where we turn and blame them anyway well i think we will eventually absolutely blame them right <laughs> the question is do we have to does, does it take longer than expected i think mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that most people did not expect them to be able to take rates from zero to five and a half percent without more pain than we've seen. Now we saw, don't get, I mean, we, we saw a lot of pain last year, right? The, the height of the pain came with the height of the expectations, right? Because even though they've raised rates a couple of times over the last year, that's much slower than they raised the previous six months. So the pace of rate hikes has slowed dramatically. And as the pace slowed dramatically and the expectations for them to slow increased, you saw markets come back from a year ago. So a year ago, literally a year ago was kind of the low in equities, right? That was the, that was the bottom. And, and since then, we've had, for the most part, 12-year, you could either call it a bull market or a bounce, you know, and I think, I think the, the debate on that's a little bit open. Whether you like the Fed or not, if you judge them on what people who do like them and want them there... Um, judge them on. They've done a pretty good job. They've they've raised rates dramatically. Inflationary pressures have come down. Now, I would argue that they can come down more, and the job's not done. But they're not still rising at the same rate, certainly as they were. And they, I would argue, they they have at least stalled. And I would even argue they've come down. Now, now, now they're not back to where they were, and perhaps they never will be. But they've also done this where the job market has held up. Now, underneath, you know, you can say, well, sort of, right? <laughs> Overall number's good. The underlying numbers are not so great. But the reality is, is if you would have gone back a year and a half ago, and if you would have said the Fed now has to try to slow the economy without crashing the market, not too many people would say that they would be able to do that and markets would be within 5% of their all-time high. Yeah, I have a theory I'm working on, and I only have a title for it. Is it possible there's some sort of a, I have no data, I have nothing else to, to tell you about this, but I named it the pandemic pain pull forward. Is it possible since the, the crash based on the pandemic, right? And I should say the response to the pandemic took a lot of the pain out. And then that quick snapback erased this sort of longer term memory that the three of us are old enough to have, where you remember that recoveries take quite a bit longer typically, than it did during the pandemic. And I mean, it seems like you can't get away in the equity market from this by the dip mentality. And not that I'm saying they should. Well, I am saying they should. I mean, generally, when you have the kind of collapses that we saw in October and the kind of collapse that we saw in the pandemic, they don't just snap back. So again, working on the theory, I don't know what I mean, but is it possible that pain was pulled forward by the pandemic? Yeah, I think that's possible. I think a lot of the buy the dip is to a certain extent a result of the change in the market structure, overly dominant nature of passive investing versus active management. Um, you know, it used to be that I don't actually have the the exact numbers right in front of me, but let's say 80 to 90 percent of the market activities were determined by a person with a brain making a decision. Right. And that's called active management. Um, indexing, where you just buy what's ever in the index, regardless of whether you think it's smart or not, that has had a huge rise over the last 20 years. And now I think it's like 50-50 between passive and active. But the nature of passive has, ha has kind of has kind of an outsized impact because, again, it's one of these things where there's no thinking going on. So as long as the market holds up and people are putting money into their 401ks, their IRAs, as long as pension funds are still taking money out of you know, their employee salaries and putting it into their pensions, that money hits those, those accounts and it automatically gets invested. It doesn't matter what the price to sales is. It doesn't matter what the earnings say. It doesn't matter what the outlook is. It's just, if there's cash, you buy. And as a result, because the markets have held up and employment has held up, that automatic inflow of cash into those accounts and the ever-present bid exists. So this change in market structure has led to it almost like these big battleship movements. It's really hard to turn. The problem is, is once it does turn, you have that same force to the other direction. So in 2020, when people started pulling money out, 
or requesting funds, there's no thinking there either. Right. It's just sell, sell whatever you can. And it's really hard to turn that as well. And that's why I think, let's just say since 2008, you've seen bigger swings and more dramatic swings. And, and I think that will probably continue. My guess is that 10 years from now or five years from now, equities will be a lot higher. But I think you're going to see these same dramatic drawdowns and, 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 and recoveries in between them. So I, I, I expect volatility to continue. And I expect these terrifying drawdowns to be a part of it. And it makes it really hard. It makes it really hard. So there's one thing. This is for the viewers. Twice Brent has said the dollar's strength compared to its peers. Now, that's a novel in one sentence. He, we, none of us are stupid enough to think the dollar is strong against a gallon of milk or a dollar is actually strong. But Brent is kind of saying, and t- tell me if I'm not if paraphrasing wrong, they're all kind of poor stewards of their own fiat currencies. They're all kind of weakening against products together, but against them, the dollar is strong. Just a head nod's fine for that. That's what, what Brent means, right? So the second thing is the government spending. So the theory up until this weekend, and again, we're recording on Tuesday, and this weekend was the uh, blow up in, um, in the Middle East, which is unfathomable. Again, you know, people look at us and you know, we're doing our jobs. We're, we're trading. We're looking at markets. We are not trying to be callous on anything. And our, and our show tomorrow uh, is actually going to be about how to position yourself in times of tumult like we're in. But anyway, government spending. The theory was is that one of the reasons that long-end bonds, were, long-end rates were going up is that issuance was growing and growing, the government's irresponsible spending. And I, I subscribe to that in, in some way. My theory about what happened on Sunday and what's going to happen in two weeks is this, is that the initial reaction is, is scared money goes to treasuries, goes to gold, goes to the dollar, but it really didn't. But it goes to treasury, so it pushes yields down. But in about a week or two, we realize that they're r- working right now on some $50 billion aid package that is going to require a shit ton of issuance of bonds. And that's a technical term, the shit ton. So our <laughs> yield's going to go screaming higher in, uh, in the farther end of the curve weeks down the road because of the same reasons that they went lower initially. I think that they probably are. I think that this bounce that we're seeing in yields is probably, or I'm sorry, bounce that we're seeing in treasuries is probably, yeah. probably an opportunity to sell duration in the short term. I still think it's possible that we're going to have this a crisis in which yields will fall or, or duration will fall on the long end, but I'm not convinced of it, so I'm not trading it. Like I don't, I don't have a bet on ten years or longer rates. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I just in my fixed end allocation is about two to three years at the most, and I'm happy just to take five percent right there and and deal with the consequences of of you know a, a big rate fall from there if I have to. But I tend to agree with you that this. Current bounce that we're seeing in yields is real. I'm sorry, in bond prices is really just it's it, it's kind of a dead count bounce on the way lower in bond prices. Yeah, nothing okay. goes in a straight yeah. line, right? Nothing. I mean, that's the and that's what makes markets tough. If you, sure. if you knew if you knew the destination from A to B was a straight line, it would be a hell of a lot easier to manage money. But the fact right. that it's not a straight line makes it very difficult. Okay. So you just mentioned, you said uh, zero to three years. Is that what you said is where you're keeping cash, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that? Yeah, most of okay. It. So yeah. the concept of the last, call it 15 years, was always that there was, there was cash on the sidelines as that was going to be the next fuel for the stock market to move higher. But that cash on the sidelines right now is sitting kind of pretty, making five and a half percent. And I don't think it's as, as quick to pull the trigger as before. I think that that's relatively obvious. But my question is is can the stocks make a new high as long as that money is so comfortable in three-month bills earning, what are, what are three-month bills getting you, 6% or whatever? Probably not, right? <laughs> and that's, you know, my, my outlook is that kind of in the, in, I don't know, sometime in the next six to nine months, we're going to have a pretty hard correction. As of right now, my belief is that's a correction that you buy. Now, I might change my mind. It'll have to depend on why it happens and when it happens and what the other factors around it are. But as of right now, my, my thesis is that that'll probably be something you want to buy. Probably because central banks will react the same way they always have and unload the spigots, go back to QE, provide liquidity, whatever, however you want to describe that. Now, it's not a definite. And, and the other thing I would say is I don't think that they are going to return to QE as quickly as most other people do. I think that they know that there's going to be pain. I think in some senses, they want that pain to show up. And I don't think that they're going to be as quickly to alleviate the pain as many other people. But 
at the end of the day, central banks are there to alleviate the pain. That is literally why they were created, right? So that you don't have a meltdown. So while they want pain, they don't want a market collapse. And so if it gets bad enough that where the system itself comes into danger, they will absolutely do whatever they need to do. But I think that they are not as quick to pull the trigger this time. The other thing, which we haven't really talked about this yet, but part of the whole dollar milkshake theory is that, again, if this is a relative game, that these the, all the debt in the world is going to have consequences. When it slows, the central banks of the world will have to return to QE and money print and stimulate. And the, so the idea is that, and the, I include the, the US in that, they will probably have to do that as well. Uh, but my idea is that all that money that gets printed kind of finds its way into the United States and that pushes prices higher, asset prices higher. Um, and so to your, to your point, Jim, the dollar could be gaining versus its fiat peers, which I think it will, while asset prices are going up in value and perhaps commodity prices are going up in value as well. Um, and so that right now is kind of why I view this next downturn, if and when it comes, as a buying opportunity. And I, I don't think that we're going to have, you know, this five-year Great Depression or whatever, 10-year Great Depression that, that some people are calling for. I can't rule it out. I understand the arguments, and they're actually pretty good arguments for why that could happen. That's just not my base case. Yeah, the thing I'm struggling with now is I can't see a scenario now where, so you've got this record issuance in treasuries, right? Yet we've got these, they're not record high yields, but they're highest yields in 20, 30 years, right? And people are saying, who's going to buy these? And then I look at sort of the risk in equities, at least to me, the risk return in equities is, is a little tough to stomach, at least from a, from a short to medium term perspective. So let's say 12 to 18 months. And people come out and say, well, who's going to buy all these treasuries? And I, I think about what you just said, where, you know, you can sit in a bill and get 5% and just keep rolling them. It seems to me like a lot of people might be interested in buying these treasuries until we get this downturn. So is there sort of a, a scenario you can see where maybe the Fed leaves rates alone, stops QT, and doesn't necessarily go, maybe goes back to a little bit of QE to engage in some yield curve control and actually threads this needle? I mean, again, is there a scenario where we're going to be complimenting the shit out of them soon? I don't know if we'll be complimenting them, but well, the it may take long. Well, yeah, again, it, 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 it may take longer to, to vilify them than, than people expect. And here's the, here's the thing with yields. I see a lot of this, and, and, and I get a lot of this because of you know, how I've talked about the U.S. is better off on a relative basis. I mean, part of the reason that yields are higher in the United States is because they can be. And what I mean by that is the yield curve, when they started raising rates, the yield curve inverted. And it's remained inverted. But they have took rates from, again, they took rates from zero to five and a half percent. If the long end didn't rise with it, the yield curve would not, be, would not be indicating recession. It would be indicating a global collapse, right? Because the yield curve would be straight up and down. <laughs> and so the idea that, and, and again, the, the, the Fed wants things to slow down, but they don't want to collapse. And so if you look back at previous bond market hiking cycles or, or Fed fund rate hiking cycles, and if you go all the way back to the 70s, I did this a couple of weeks ago, and I just looked at what happened. Now, this, this current bond sell-off is as bad as it's ever been. But the bond sell-off in the late 80s was very similar. Uh, the bond sell-off in the, or in the early, late 70s was, was very similar, even though I don't think central bankers are the smartest people. In the world. I do think that they understand that if you raise rates, bond prices fall. So I don't think, and, and if you think about it, part of the reason, there's three reasons why they raise. Again, if you put, your, put yourself in their shoes and try to understand what they're doing, they think that raising rates will help inflation. The reason they think that is because if you raise rates, then the cost of money increases and it will discourage more people from borrowing and investing and buying that thing. And so therefore, some of the price pressure on prices will come down. So that's number one. The second thing is that if you discount cash flows to come to, cal to, come to valuations, if rates are higher, now you are dividing by a bigger number. And if you divide by a bigger number, you get a lower valuation. So that's another way that they think raising rates will help get prices down. But the third way that raising rates helps get prices down is that when you raise rates, fixed income prices fall. And fixed income prices, and I'm specifically referring to treasuries here, 
Treasuries are the biggest source of collateral off of which all money is loaned into existence in the first place. So if you contract the price of the collateral or the value of the collateral, you have just decreased the amount of new money that can be created on top of it. So the idea that the Fed had no idea that raising rates would cause long-term bond prices to fall, it's, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Of course they know that. Powell even gave a speech about it 10 years ago where he said, we're setting ourselves up for a situation when interest rates rise, duration is going to fall. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, I don't think Powell forgot that fact over the last 10 years. Um, you know, maybe he's misguided, but he's not dumb. Um, and so, you know, then the other thing is if you look now, the yield curve, it's starting, you got this bear steepener, right? And like the long end is coming up. So it's still inverted and it's still indicating recession. But if yields continue to rise, it's not too much longer. And all of a sudden you've got a flat yield curve and a flat yield curve doesn't indicate recession. This is a long way of saying, you know, what you're talking about, Bobby, is it might take longer and it might not happen right away is I'm explaining why it might take longer and why it, why it might not happen right away. And listen, we might come in tomorrow and the markets might be crashing. I don't know. You know, I'm not smart enough to know exactly what the markets are going to do. I, I just try to figure out the different scenarios that can happen and what those probabilities are and, and, and try to be ready for them. But regardless of what happens with yields in the U.S., my, I think my biggest message to other people is when the U.S. raises rates, they're not only raising rates on the United States. When the U.S. raises rates, they raise rates on the whole world because the whole world uses dollars for trade. They use dollars to fund their operations. They have borrowed an incredible amount of dollars in dollars, and they have to pay it back in dollars. And in fact, most people don't know this, but you know, most people know that the U.S. owes over $30 trillion now. I don't even know what the number is, $32, $33 trillion. But entities outside the United States also owe over $30 trillion to each other. So they don't owe that to the United States. They owe that to the other. That's called the euro dollar market, the euro dollar you know, credit market. That's a lot of money that the rest of the world has to repay in dollars. And so as the, as the U.S. raises rates and it makes the dollar rise versus those peers, let's say that uh, you borrowed a million, let's say you lived in, uh, you lived in Turkey and you borrowed a million dollars last year to build a, I don't know, a shoe factory or whatever it is. And then the Turkish lira loses 10% versus the dollar over the next year. That's essentially now that you have to pay off $1.1 million right? Forget about the interest rate. That's just the principle. And so as, as the U.S. raises rates and the dollar rises versus uh, these other currencies, that puts increasing economic pressure on the rest of the world, which is exactly why a year ago, the Bank of England had to bail out the U.K. gilt market. Japan had to bail out both the Japanese government bond market and the yen market. It's why the when the ECB raised rates for the first time in 10 years, they also simultaneously introduced a facility to go buy Italian bonds to keep those yields down. And it's why China had to dramatically decrease the reserve requirements in order to keep their, their real estate market. And I th here's the thing is, this is probably the most controversial part of, of my thesis is that I think the U.S. knows this. And I think the U.S. uses the U.S. dollar and U.S. interest rates as, a, as an economic tool. And if you want to call it a weapon, I would go so far as to say it's a weapon. They can put other countries in economic pressure points just by raising rates. And so maybe, maybe the first four and a half percent of rate hikes last year were for the U.S. domestic economy. And maybe the last hundred basis points was a screw you to the rest of the world, right? Wow. Or, or anybody who's trying to, to, trying to, to take on the U.S. on uh, you know, geopolitical factors. So. I think there's a little bit of both going on. Okay. I have a couple, there's a couple of points I wanted to make real quickly. The point you made about the contraction of collateral, I think, is freaking brilliant. And I've never really thought of that before, and I appreciate that. So my takeaway from the episode is I will never think about this at the same way. Um, Bobby, <laughs> yeah. you, real yields at 2.45%, if you believe. The calculation that goes into real yields is so completely arbitrary, it seems like, because there's really no way to measure inflation. But let's just say yep. real 10-year yields are 2.45, the highest in 16, 18 years. In a normal situation, gold would be pummeled. Gold, if they yep. kept their same correlation or inverse correlation to real yields, they'd be pummeled. They're not. US, I mean, global central banks stockpiling gold. 
the first six months of this year was up. Uh, record buying of gold the last three months alone 219 tons is something first of all is gold coiled ready to move when the fed pivots is this strength a sign of that is what we're seeing the reflection gold is there a little bit of reluctance to the for the dollar for global central banks a move away i'm not talking about you know yeah i'm talking about this much of a move away how do you interpret it i i am a huge gold bull long term i i think gold and dollars are the two most important pieces of any portfolio. So if you don't own gold, I don't care what the price is. I think you should go buy some, right? Now, if you already own gold, I don't know that right now is the time to go add to it. But I do think it's coiling. And and so this is the way I would answer your question. Gold has held up extremely well over the last year and a half in the face of enormous rate hikes. And, and the falling of the real yields, right? And so I tend to think that gold trades inverse to real yields. It held up really well until a couple of weeks ago uh-huh. and or till the last Fed meeting. And over that time period, equities had held up really well until the last Fed meeting. And even though bond prices had fallen off, they had started to kind of slow, the descent had kind of started to slow until the last Fed meeting. So long story, this is a way, this is a long way of saying, I think the markets, not just the gold market, not just the stock market, but also the bond market and commodity markets is kind of having this come to Jesus moment with maybe rate, maybe long-term rates are not going to go back down. Maybe they are going to go higher and maybe they're going to stay there for longer than we previously anticipated because not only did the Fed punted on hiking rates, but they took away two rate cuts that were previously expected in 2024. And I think that was the most hawkish part of, of the last meeting. And so I think, and after that meeting, you know, gold, you know, equities are down a couple percent, you know, bonds fell another couple percent and gold fell a hundred bucks, you know, what's that three or 4%. And I, th- I think it's all trying to figure it out right now. And over the last couple of days with what's gone on in the Middle East, this is my interpretation, is that the market has said, okay, where we previously thought rates were going to go higher because the Fed was going to stay lo- you know, higher for longer. Now, maybe because of these geopolitical things, they are not going to be higher for longer. But I think they actually are going to be higher for longer, which goes back to what we talked about earlier. I think the bond bounce is kind of short term. I think the equity bounce over the last couple of days is a little bit short term. And I think the gold bounce that we've seen over the last couple of days is a little bit short term. I I think all of these prices will probably be lower at some point in the next two months. If we get a hard further sell-off in gold, I think that's the opportunity where you go buy and you go buy a bunch of it because I think it is coiling. And I think what comes in the years ahead is going to send gold much, much higher. You know, Brett, you talked about this bear steepener and just for the record, people should know that you're talking about the direction that bond prices are going in, right? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, yields, you look at yields since the beginning of September, the two years only up nine basis points. So the yeah. 10 years up 46 and the 30 years up 54 basis points on the yield side of things. I did an interview in November of last year and I said my trade of the year was gold. And that looked really good to about May, June, right? It looked great, as a matter of fact. And then yields started rising. And one of the things that I keep hearing from people is that the Fed is going to begin cutting. The Fed is going to begin cutting. And I don't believe they can do it unless they accept higher inflation. When I look at the wage component of the jobs figures, I do not see wages falling in a way that's consistent with a scenario of 2% inflation. I still don't see it. You continued strikes. 650,000 people go on strike this summer. That's bigger than 2020, uh, 19 and 20 combined, right? Actually, you could throw 18 in there and it just about reaches that level. So I look at gold still up 3% on the year. And I still think it's phenomenal trade when you look at it from a risk perspective. Am I wrong? No, no, I, I, no, no, no. I, I agree with you. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing that people have to realize. Again, things don't move in a straight line. If the gold in your portfolio should be the longest term asset that you have, unless you hit a crisis tomorrow, right? Um, the reason you buy gold is, if, is it, 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 this is my opinion. I, I think you buy gold because of, you know, real yields falling or an inflationary environment or political idiocy, right? Or political crisis when your currency comes under, uh, under attack. Despite everybody's, or not everybody, 
despite many people's expectations, the dollar is not in crisis. The dollar is at its highest level versus its peers in decades. Gold doesn't need to go up right now in dollar terms because we're not having a crisis in dollar terms right now. Gold has done exactly what it's supposed to do in yen terms, in euro terms, in lira terms. And, and the fact that it's held up very well to your point this year in dollar terms shows that it is doing what it's supposed to do in dollars as well. And I actually think we're going to get into an, a period of time where the dollar is rising versus all the fiat peers and gold is rising versus all the fiat peers and gold is rising versus the dollar, in which case you have gold and dollar rising together against all the other currencies. Because they'll be adding more stimulus at the time. Exactly. Than we... right, exactly. Okay. But that's the other thing that people need to realize is we're not going to go back into a situation where the U.S. government can't fund itself, but China can fund itself and Japan can fund itself and Italy can fund itself. We're not going to have the bond vigilante show up in the U.S. and not show up elsewhere. It, the, the system is just not designed like that. It, it, it won't go down like that. And so while, you know, I, but, but that doesn't mean that gold won't go to $5,000 anyway, right? I think gold could go much, much higher. Um, but it's probably not going to be in a straight line. And so listen, so if you buy gold, let's say, let's say gold, let's say you don't own any gold right now, any, and you go buy it and it's like what, 1840 or 1850 or whatever it is. And it goes down a hundred bucks. Well, good. The rest of your portfolio is not in gold. This way you don't put all your money in one thing, right? And if one part of your portfolio is going down, then maybe that means another part of your portfolio is going up. If you're, if every part of your portfolio is going in the same direction, well, then you're not diversified. You know, and you should be diversified. But if gold pulls back a hundred or hundred fifty dollars, who cares? That's when you add to it a little bit. So I don't, I don't really care what gold does right here. You know, to be honest, I don't own gold for what happens over the next year. I, I hold gold for what happens over the next decade. You know, five years to ten years, and I think gold will do very well over that time period. I, I think there will be a lot of people who will disagree with this, but I think if you think about it, you'll you, you'll realize that it actually does kind of work this way. And that is, I mentioned earlier that the U.S., when the U.S. raises rates, it raises rates on the rest of the world. And the U.S. has the ability to use the dollar as a weapon, right? So a year and a half ago, the U.S. confiscated, along with many other Western governments, I don't remember what the exact number, five or six hundred billion dollars Russia. worth of Russian treasury, you know, Russian reserves, right? Just took them. They don't have them. Now, if the U.S. wanted to give those back to the rest of to Russia, they could. They're probably not going to, but they could. But the U.S. had the ability to take it from them. And that was seen as very overtly use of, of, of the dollar system as an economic weapon. And there was a lot of pushback against that, right? Okay. Well, think about what also has happened over the last year and a half. By raising rates from zero to 5%, the U.S. confiscated a hell of a lot more than $500 billion from all the treasury bonds the rest of the world holds in their reserves. So all those charts that you see of, you know, Saudi Arabia selling treasuries and China selling treasuries and the, you know, they dropped by three or four hundred billion dollars. That's not them selling bonds. That's the value of those bonds losing value. Those are mark to market charts. And so the U.S. confiscated reserves of its competitors by raising rates. Because the U.S. could raise rates, whereas the rest of the world couldn't. Mm. And so if we want to give those reserves back to them, we could drop rates and do that. Or maybe we just leave rates here for a while. And if they want to sell those dollars they bought, they can sell them, but they're going to pay a prepayment penalty to get them. So, so uh, what you're saying is wow, there's a cockiness that comes with our standing, with where our dollar is. and the fact yes. so, so it actually, in the long term, may lead to worse stewardship of our dollar because of because of this cockiness this is fascinating to me. that i i love yeah, that explanation that you was just great gave. great I, I love that yeah, yeah. all right so anyway that's most, my story that's my story I'm and i'm sticking, sticking to, to it, it. <laughs> right, this is the, <laughs> the most fun podcast you've ever done just say it out loud no People, it's the best yeah it's the best okay good i appreciate it thank you brent good to see you as always all right.